Jay and I were talking before we, we came up here about how both he and I are sometimes asked to answer for Jeff Jarvis's ideas, Jarvis being a, a, a more optimistic than I am about the short term, and I assume more, more optimistic than you are, just because he's the 10 on the optimist scale, uh, about the future of accountability journalism near term. So there's, in the, in the usual framing of the debate, it's, well, here's some optimists and here's some pessimists, and all the pessimists think alike and all the optimists right. think alike. When in fact, among the people who are thinking hard about the internet, there are significant disagreements that have nothing totally. to do with the traditional medium. And, and that ties into the second, I think, big problem with the debate, which is journalists were like kept women up until about the middle of last year, right? They <laughs> heard from the advertisers, don't you worry, honey, do your thing. Bags of money are coming in on the other side of this wall. Just don't look over there. We don't want to tell you how the money's coming in. And so journalists, you know, whatever, they went and did their job. And then all of a sudden, about the middle of 2008, they start hearing this word, business model. Business model. They didn't model. even know they right. had a business model up until 2008. Right. And then it turns out you have to make more money than you spend. And then they go and investigate this a little bit. It turns out you have to do that every single year. Yeah. Right? So this, this is a revelation. Right? <laughs> and so suddenly the conversation goes to business model. And there is an illusion so implicit it's almost not mentioned, which is if we can just return the income, every, we can reverse the flow of time. And uninvent the internet. Yeah, yeah. Un 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 all we need to do is figure out, well, you micropayments plus paywalls plus subscriptions plus this plus that, and we'll start throwing off 30% gross margins again. Right. And the, what I think is wrong with that completely setting aside whether or not Rupert Murdoch will be, continue to be able to feed his family or what have you, is that the entire substrate of the news business is shifting. And if all of the income came back tomorrow, very little of the pressures on newspapers would go away. Mm -hmm. Because the assembly of the public, the availability of facts, the, the existence and mental models of reporters, uh, distribution versus super distribution, all of those things that have little to do with the business model but everything to do with the nature of how a public informs itself are also changing at the same time. Okay, so let's go there because uh, I did my dissertation on the public. Mm. I can tell we're going to say Habermas soon. The I idea, beat you to it by about 30 seconds. The whole idea of, uh, of the public mm -hmm. and where it comes from. And I find myself when I get frustrated with current debates about, about the press and when people ask me what's the, what's the future of journalism, mm -hmm. which to me is very opaque, yeah. I find that sometimes the best thing I can do is actually go backward yep. in time, yep. right? To try and figure out, well, when did we start worrying about journalism in the first place? Mm -hmm. When did we, when we start talking about the press? Mm -hmm. And so we, if we ask that kind of question, Habermas says that... A minute and a half. Yeah. That we start talking about the press when we have this class of people, the bourgeois, who realize that they have some sort of stake in the right. state and the decisions that are being made by the people who run the state. Mm -hmm. right? And they also begin to have means of finding out what the state is doing. Right. Right? And um, the proto-newspapers of the day begin telling them, not completely, but at least a little bit, about what's going on inside the circles of power. Now, previous to that time, politics is the possession of the people inside the court. Right. right? It appears to the public only in ceremonies and rituals and uh, occasions when they can glorify the state. Uh, and debate, political debate, is confined to a very small group of people inside power. But uh, eventually what happens is the state has to begin to open itself. For example, the first person to ever write in a sustained treatise on public opinion is the finance minister of the King of France. Why does he write about it? Because the King of France uh, has debt that the bourgeoisie hold. 
And the only way that he can keep the price down for lending money is by telling people the finances of the King of France. So the finance minister is arguing to the crown, we have to open our books. We have mm -hmm. to show people what our finances are. Because if we don't, the risk premium goes, the risk the premium roof. goes up through That's the roof. And these people can actually affect what we're able to do. Right. And if you want to fight that war against the Spanish or the British and you expect to borrow money and to do it, the only way that you can borrow this money is if you are actually more open about your finances. And that, and, and that original bourgeois public, which is actually a very small right. Right. proportion of right. people, is the original public. So right. Habermas calls this the carrier class. Mm -hmm for the idea of a public, which is actually a universal idea, but it begins mm -hmm. with this class. So that the origins of the press, the origins of the public, and the origins of what we now call public opinion mm -hmm. are all yep. <laughs> right in the same set of events. Right? So here's my question to you. Is there a carrier class for the public well, today. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is the um, Cass Sunstein question from Republic.com and Republic.com 2.0. Sunstein was the person who probably did the most to inject the idea of uh, the echo chamber as a cause of concern in the political sphere was the internet enabling the, uh, the, the assembly of small groups that listened mainly to themselves. And uh, I do a class on participatory media uh, at, at ITP where I teach and this year um, I retooled it and called it media economics and participation because it has to do uh, now more with the tension between traditional media and newer more participatory models and so we've been we've we've um, kind of gotten this spectrum of opinion about the the nature of the public and Habermas holds down one end of the spectrum mm. the idea of small ideologically focused papers. Habermas at one point in tr uh, Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere says that every association has a newspaper and every newspaper has an association, which is to say that there's... De Tocqueville this says this. Feedback. I'm sorry, he's quoting yeah. De Tocqueville. Yeah. But, but approves of this feedback loop that says there is uh, the, 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 the tightness of a group of people who has a particular ideology is best served by a small uh, a small journalistic outlet, and you want lots of those small outlets arguing out in the public sphere. Right. Um, for Habermas, I mean, the thing I love about Habermas is, to him, the death of journalism began when free speech was legalized. Because up until that point, to publish a newspaper was to make a political argument about the nature of political speech, and not just to be running a business. Uh, Starr, Paul Starr, on the other hand, a great sociologist of, of, of media at Princeton who wrote uh, uh, Creation of the Media, for Star, the, the, the other end of the spectrum is that media is best when it assembles large, moderate, stable political groups that coexist geographically and persist over long periods of time. Like, like the, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Like the Philadelphia Inquirer, like the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Metro Daily in its full and Glory. glorious, yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, what's been interesting is placing other of the thinkers we, we talk about in class on this spectrum and Sunstein is a you know is at the pegs the needle at the star end of the spectrum mm -hmm. and for him the 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 scenario that Habermas most approved of right you know just just post revolutionary france with lots of little uh, lots of little papers duking it out uh, in the public for the public to to Sunstein that's kind of anathema Mm. And echo chambers, right? Exactly, yeah. right. I think I think that that that's. I mean, it's it put it's put puts a word in Sunstein's mouth, but not not one that I think is unfair to the to the quality of thought in Republic.com, which is Habermas's small papers are echo chambers of a group thinking through a particular ideology. So in in the Habermas world, the, you know the 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 question is, are you a narco syndicalist enough to read my newspaper? <laughs> and in Star's world, the question is, do you have any money? And the, the, if the question for a reader is, do you have any money, the paper will naturally expand to include as many people who can answer that question, yes, and become a, media, a moderating force in, in, in politics. And, and what, I've, what I think is so interesting is that in times of 
crisis, of which there have been many in, in the media industry, one of the reflexive strategies of the people in the older media is to, is to declare the period that, that started ending five years ago to have been de facto the golden era. Right, and the nature um, of journalism. Exactly right. Yeah. So then, right, we finally got it right, and then this internet thing came along and, and screwed it all screwed up. Screwed it all yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. And so, so newspapers, which have been losing readership since the mid 1980s, but gaining in uh, revenues, suddenly discovered a public conscience circa 2008. Right. And they didn't complain when the revenues were going up, but the readership was going down. Now many newspapers have 10x their old readership because of the web, but now that, that readership is going up and advertising is going down, now it's a public service crisis. Right. And so the, the, the thing that I think is so interesting about going back to the idea of the public is that you start looking at you start looking at reporting and the kind of honesty that having someone some external class of truth tellers observing principally the government but also businesses uh, you start looking at that from the demand side and not from the supply mm. side mm -hmm. and what you see when you look at it from the demand side is that newspapers always served in their in their political news function they always served a minority class mm -hmm. Right, the New York Times puts news about you know the events in Tegucigalpa on the front page, not because they think, oh my God, everybody is going to rush in to figure out what's going on in the Honduras, but because they are asserting to the political class, this is what's going on. Right. Um, if 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 you care, if you want to be informed, but right, the the paper comes in sections, and it's not so that Yankee fans can run across news from the Honduras, right? It's so that people who only care about sports can strip out the sports section mm -hmm. and go straight to that. The omnibus can, newspaper. Exactly. Yeah. You can strip out the home section. But that doesn't work that. anymore. That doesn't work anymore. Right. And that's, that is, I think, when you, when you drop the idea that newspapering up to five years ago was, was in its golden era, what you start to see is that the idea of putting a crossword puzzle together with news from Tegucigalpa and the Yankees box score makes zippo sense. It's not right? natural either. No, it, yeah. it, it, it's yeah. an unnatural act. It's, it's the constraints of the printing press, as you, as you mentioned earlier. The, the ability to serve news junkies, to serve people like us, I mean, we're, we're mainlining this stuff now. I mean, this, is, this, is, this is it. We are in paradise if what you care about is access to information. Uh, but infovores are a tiny, tiny section of the population. And I think, the, I think the, the big question becomes, how can the average citizen, as they have always done, ignore news of the day to the 99th percentile and yet periodically be alarmed when there is a crisis? Mm. Because it, it, news junkies will always be news junkies. Washington is always going to get an incredible amount of scrutiny. New York, L.A. It's Boca Raton and Oswego and St. Louis that mm. we ought to be worrying about. And there, the, the old mechanism was mainly it's, you know, oh, look, it's summer and somebody's eating some watermelon on the front page, right? And this is, this is what I grew up with. This is the Missouri, like you knew it was summer because the newspaper mm. took a picture of somebody eating some watermelon. <laughs> and, right, I mean, this, you know, it's the kind of um, just following along journalism. And then every now and again, something really horrible happens, right? There's, you know, there's, there's, there's biological contamination in the Ozarks. And the paper can put that on the front page. And what it says to civic leaders, the government, is, you know, we'd actually rather run pictures of water, people eating watermelons, too. The readers prefer that. But if you don't behave yourselves, we're we'll putting put you your on face the on the front page. Yeah, you'll be on the front page. So, right. so it's the threat of surveillance. So right. this is yeah. the thing. So there are many, many publics that are assembled by a newspaper. And mm -hmm. we call them the public mm -hmm. as a bookkeeper. But it's thing. actually a bunch of little publics. Right. But yeah. in fact, you and me getting everything we want does nothing to help the citizens of Boca Raton keep civic corruption at a manageable level. Right. And there are fewer infovores in Boca Raton per capita than in New York City right. because people who were born elsewhere come here when they're infovores or, or you know, some, some equivalent global, global city. So I think the, the, the big question is how do you threaten business and civic leaders with the possibility that if things get too corrupt, too out of hand, et cetera, mm -hmm. 
the alarm can be sounded, and ordinary citizens who are paying absolutely no attention to the news, as they typically don't, will suddenly be aware of it. Mm -hmm. The old thing was, you're subscribing to get Irma Rombauer in your horoscope, right? Which people read more reliably than they or read. Or the sports news. Or the sports news, exactly. Yeah. My hometown paper, which I, re I, I, as I said, I teach this, I'm teaching this class at ITP, and I realized, you know, I've been teaching at ITP 10 years now, and the average age of my students has remained about the same. My average age, on the other hand, has grown at the alarming rate of about one year one per year. Per year, yeah. And it's, it's inexorable. It, it yeah. occurred to me when I was doing this class and talking about traditional media, like, I have to buy physical newspapers and bring them into the class and hand them out to the students so they, they will know. see one. Yeah, yeah. So they will know what we're yeah. talking about. And yeah. indeed, we, we did a show of hands. How many people in here get, get any of their news from the newspaper? I think 17 hands out of 20 uh, went up. Or maybe, in fact, I think it was everybody at, at some point gets, gets news from a, from, a, from a newspaper. How many do that on paper? 15 of 20 hands go down. Mm -hmm. right, so 75% of my students do not read on paper at all. I said, how many people read the paper regularly? Three more hands go down. So 10% mm -hmm. of my class reads the newspaper regularly. Mm. Uh, so I suddenly had this stack of papers, and I bought them my hometown paper from Columbia, Missouri. I had this stack of papers, and I did a news biopsy. I just cut it up, and I weighed all the articles just to see comparatively how much is produced locally, how much do they buy you know, from wire services, two to one ratio. Uh, how much is news and how much is other stuff, Fluff. like the horoscope, yeah. two to one ratio. Right. Uh, and then I checked the masthead. There are six reporters on staff for hard news. There are 11 sports reporters. So out of a masthead of, or a, yeah, ju just, a, just a masthead of 60, not even counting the business side. So we've always been, people who care about actual civic news have always been a tiny part of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I don't know, is not how will people who, who are news junkies get more data than they had last week. That, that is a solved problem. It's how will people who mainly don't care about the news be suddenly alarmed when something is going terribly mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the function of the front page served, and I don't see enough of an equivalent now to be convinced that that mm -hmm. is going to be a solved problem in the mm -hmm. short term.